Hi, my name is Maddie Gamble and I'm a PhD student at Dartmouth College. This lesson is meant to be a basic introduction to the salmon life cycle and the concept of life history trade-offs. This module is rooted in evolutionary biology, which is the science of understanding why and how different kinds of plants and animals have come to be the way they are. Evolutionary biologists like me ask questions such as, why do some butterflies have spots on their wings? Why are poisonous animals and plants often brightly colored? And why do some organisms live for just one year while others live for five years or 30 years or even 100 years? In particular, this module focuses on salmon and trout and why their life cycle has come to be the way it is. So what are salmon and trout and where in the world do they live? Salmon are a family of fishes that are native to colder regions of the Northern Hemisphere. The family includes multiple genera, including Oncorhynchus, which are the Pacific salmon and trout, and Salmo, which are the Atlantic salmon and the brown trout. Most salmon and many trout are anadromous, which means they spend part of their life cycle in freshwater and part in the ocean. We'll come back to that quickly, but first, before we learn about the salmon life cycle, let's do a quick poll to see how you have interacted with salmon and trout. Put up a hand if you have never heard of salmon and trout, eaten them, caught or studied them. If you have caught or studied salmon or trout, where have you found them? I personally have caught salmon and trout in streams, lakes, and the ocean which are a pretty diverse set of habitats. So now let's dive into the salmon life cycle. Salmon and trout have very interesting and very variable life cycles. They start their lives in fresh water as eggs buried in the gravel. They eat and grow in the river until they are big enough to migrate to the ocean. This can take anywhere from a few months to eight or more years. When they migrate to the ocean, they undergo a metamorphosis where they change shape they become longer and skinnier, and they change color, they become silvery and lose their spots. They eat and grow in the ocean for anywhere between six months to six years. And when they're ready to reproduce, they migrate back to their home river. These migrations can be over a thousand kilometers or 600 miles. One of the longest migrations is to Redfish Lake in Idaho on the west coast of the United States. Those fish swim 900 miles and gain 6,500 feet in elevation. Upon returning to the river where they were born, the females dig nests and lay their eggs in the gravel. In this picture, you can see the female all the way in the back and four males, the small, smallest of which is in the foreground of the picture. And this fish spent fewer years in the ocean than the other males. And that's why it's so much smaller. The parts of the life cycle that are most variable are the ages at which salmon migrate from fresh water to salt water and back. We call these decisions life history decisions because they play a big role in how the animal survives and reproduces. So now let's break up into groups and talk about these three questions. Write down some ideas and answers and then when we get back together as a group we'll share our responses. The questions are how do salmon and trout live in such different environments? What challenges do you think salmon face during migration? And why would they make such a difficult and dangerous migration in the first place? We'll pause the video now. You can talk about these questions in your groups. And when we reconvene, be ready to share some answers and thoughts. Welcome back. OK, now that we're ready to share our thoughts, I will tell you some of the answers that I came up with to each of these questions. First, how do salmon and trout live in such different environments? One answer is the physiological changes that occur during the metamorphosis before salmon migrate to the ocean. These physiological changes allow salmon to switch from keeping salt inside their bodies in freshwater to pumping salt out of their bodies in salt water. Juvenile salmon migrating to the ocean also change shape. They become longer and skinnier before they migrate to the ocean which facilitates swimming in open water instead of lakes and rivers. Juvenile salmon also change color before they migrate to salt water. In rivers and streams, they're colorful and spotted to blend in with the rocky river bottoms. But when they get to the ocean, they are silvery with darker backs and white stomachs for better camouflage in open water. Second question, 
What challenges do you think salmon face during migration? Some answers that I came up with include predation from bears, birds, larger fish, seals, and whales, running into man-made dams, the energetic costs of swimming up a, a river against the current flowing down river, often for hundreds or even thousands of miles or kilometers, and stranding. And this happens when large adult salmon return to the small rivers where they were born, and their bodies are often deeper than the water, as in the picture above. If they get stuck, they will die before they're able to reproduce. Third question, why would salmon make such a difficult and dangerous migration at all? Some answers that I came up with include the following. Rivers and streams, freshwater environments, are relatively safe places for juvenile salmon to live. However, there's much less food available in freshwater than in the ocean. The ocean, on the other hand, is full of predators and really risky, but also full of energy-rich food. Salmon life history seems to be a solution to the trade-off between higher survival and low growth opportunity in freshwater and lower survival, but higher growth opportunity in saltwater. So now that we know salmon life cycles can be so variable, how do we learn about an individual fish's life history? Turns out we can learn about it from looking at their scales. Fish scales show us these important life history decisions by telling us about fish growth. This works because as the fish grows, so does the scale. It's just like human skin, where when we grow, our skin needs to grow to keep us covered. The same thing happens with fish scales. During scale growth, rings are laid down at regular intervals on the scale, and this happens about once a week. That means that the spacing between the rings tells us how fast the fish was growing when that part of the scale was created. So bigger spaces indicate faster growth and smaller spaces equal slower growth. Because growth is slower in freshwater and during the winter, regardless of whether the fish is in freshwater or in saltwater, narrower spaces indicate either life in freshwater or a winter in the ocean. So let's walk through this scale as an example of how to read the fish's life history. This first red bracket encompasses the growth that this fish achieved during its first year of life. Because all those rings are close together, and because rings closer to the middle of the scale were created early in the fish's life, we can tell that this fish spent its whole first year in freshwater. The next bracket encompasses growth during the fish's second year. Because the radius of the scale, the length of the scale, is proportional to the fish's length, we can see right away that the fish grew five to six times more than the, during the second year than during the first year of its life. Near the top of the bracket, the rings are really close together, suggesting that these were created in freshwater during the early spring and summer of the second year of life. Then suddenly the rings get much wider, and this indicates that the fish migrated to the ocean and started to grow much faster. Finally, at the end of this bracket, the rings get closer together, and that indicates the first winter in the ocean. The third bracket encompasses the third year of the fish's life, still in the ocean, starting at the end of the winter and ending when the fish was caught and the scale was sampled. So growth is really important in life history decisions, like when to leave freshwater and when to return to freshwater to reproduce. And that is because both of these decisions are related to when the fish reaches a certain size threshold. And growth is also related to temperature. So climate change might have a big impact on a fish's life history decisions. And that's a topic we'll come back to at the end of this lesson. But first, now it's your turn to annotate some fish scales. So at this point, students should break up into groups. And each group will focus on annotating either all of these scales or just one of them. The goal in annotating these scales is to answer three questions. First, how many years did this fish live in freshwater before migrating to the ocean? How many years did this fish live in the ocean before the scale was sampled? And finally, how many years in total did the fish live? Um, and if you'd like, students can use the Jamboard associated with this module for your group discussions and scale annotations. And in about 30 minutes, we'll come back uh, and join back together as a group so that each group can present their annotations of one of the scales.
Welcome back. Let's go through the scale annotations. Here's the first scale. And if the first group wants to come up and annotate this scale, that would be great. We'll pause the video until the scale annotation is done. Now that the students have had a chance to annotate this scale, I'll show you my annotations for the same scale. This fish, uh, I think, lived for one, two years in fresh water and three years in salt water, making for a five-year-old fish in total. So now let's move on to scale number two. We'll pause the video while students annotate the scale, and then I'll show you my annotations for the same scale. Here are my annotations for scale number two. The way I see it, this fish lived for three years in fresh water before migrating to the ocean, and then three years in salt water before returning to spawn. So that makes for a six-year-old fish in total. Now let's have the students from the third group come up and annotate scale number three. We'll pause the video and when we come back, I'll show you my annotations for scale three. Here is what I had for scale number three. To me, it looks like this fish lived for four years in fresh water before migrating to the ocean and then lived for just two years in salt water. So it was also a six-year-old fish, but lived for many more of its six years in salt water, sorry, in fresh water than the last fish that we saw. So here's the final scale. And we'll pause the video now to see what uh, the fourth group found for annotating this scale. Here are my annotations for the fourth scale. This fish, like the last one, lived for four years in fresh water, but this fish just lived for one year in salt water before returning to spawn. That makes it a five-year-old fish in total. So to wrap up, in this lesson, we've learned that life history is based on growth and that growth can be related to temperature. We've also learned that salmon sometimes face challenges related to stranding and the energetic costs of swimming up a river, both of which change based on precipitation. So to wrap up, let's summarize what we've learned and then think about how climate change might affect the salmon life cycle. First, how does temperature relate to growth? The relationship between growth and temperature is actually parabolic. That means that growth increases as temperature increases up until a point where the temperature reaches the fish's physiological limits. Above that temperature, growth declines sharply, and at very high temperatures, the fish can lose weight or even die. Second, how does growth relate to life history? Faster growth means the fish migrates to salt water at an earlier age and a smaller size, and also that it returns to fresh water to spawn at an earlier age and a smaller size. So taking these two things together, let's think about how changes in temperature and precipitation associated with climate change might affect salmon and their life cycle. Some answers that I came up with include the following. Warmer water will mean faster growth to a point, which will result in fish spending less time in fresh water before migrating to the ocean. If the water becomes too warm before fish migrate to the ocean, the salmon will die before they make it to salt water at all. Increased precipitation will lower the risk of stranding as fish migrate back up to the river to spawn, but will increase the cost of migrating up river. On the other hand, decreased precipitation will increase the risk of stranding, but decrease the cost of migrating up the river, as long as the river doesn't dry up completely. Changes in precipitation can also affect water temperature, since larger bodies of water have more thermal inertia, which means that they don't change temperature as fast as smaller bodies of water. Finally, how might changes in the salmon life cycle affect other parts of the ecosystem? Here are two answers that I came up with. The first has to do with the prey and the predators that the salmon rely on and that rely on the salmon. Changes in temperature and precipitation might also affect the food that salmon eat or the predators that eat salmon. And those changes will affect salmon growth 
and survival as well. Second, rising temperatures might mean that salmon will be younger and thus smaller when they mature and return to freshwater to spawn. This is actually the time in the salmon life cycle when fishers catch salmon to sell them to fish markets. If they're catching smaller, younger salmon, that means that fishers will make less money and that people will have to buy multiple fish in order to get the same quantity of, of salmon meat. That concludes our module on salmon life history. Thanks for participating.